All right, you can go ahead, Steve. Okay. Good evening. I want to welcome everyone on the Explorers Facebook page and the YouTube channel. We have an incredible talk this evening given by Lynn Sykes, who's used basically sound waves and other uh, mechanisms to understand about earthquakes. Well, the Explorers Club is going to be talking, you know, is going to be talking about earthquakes tonight, but tomorrow night is going to be a another presentation, um, just not about earthquakes, but what to do when it hits home. And so we're going to have extreme weather and natural disaster documentarian George Coronas and emergency preparedness journalist Jason Hopper, who want to turn everyone into disaster busters, basically. And they're going to talk about tips on best, best methods and readiness, both in the field and at home. And this will be tomorrow, Tuesday, January 26, starting around 7 p.m., same time, same channel. And then on Thursday, we're going to have um, another presentation on the Southwest chapter member, uh, George Venny, and he's going to talk about the International Year of Caves and Costs, uh, about the Explorers Club. And so tonight, it is my great honor to introduce our speaker this evening, Lynn Sykes. He's a Higgins Professor of Earth and Environmental Sciences at Columbia University. And, you know, when I was a postdoctoral research scientist at Columbia about 17, 18 years ago, Lynn, as well as a few others like Walter Pist, uh, Pittman, were considered among the giants of geology there. And while I didn't have much of a chance to get to know him because I was working on all the types of research, everyone there knew that Lynn was a leading scientific figure and pioneer using seismology, which is basically the study of sound waves that travel through the earth. And that he was part of the early development of plate tectonics, basically. And then afterwards, developing innovative methods to precisely locate earthquakes, and then as well, use new technology to detect and locate underground nuclear testing. Wow, okay. And I just wanna start off by just saying real quick that we've all grown up with plate tectonics. Okay, we take it for granted, but it may surprise you that it only became scientifically accepted just a little over maybe 50, 53 years ago. And before this time, scientists had little understanding about the mechanisms involved in the movements of the Earth's crust, how mountains formed, where oceans were deep. But thanks to the concept of plate tectonics, we now understand how mountains are created and how they're destroyed, that continents actually move. Okay, I know we take this for granted today, but in essence, plate tectonics is now the great unifying theory for geology that has ultimately explained the process that have shaped our planet for billions of years. And Lynn was part of a small cadre of intrepid and brilliant young scientists collecting data in the early days of plate tectonics. And thanks to him and his colleagues, we now understand how the planet works. Um, he was uh, collecting data and using data from oceanographic research vessels that provided these unique uh, eure eureka moments concerning how the continents moved on these rigid plates on a mantle that was more like a molasses called the asthenosphere. And, but now, you know, after that, uh, Lynn started concentrating on earthquake forecasting and prediction, um, as well as the verification of underground nuclear tests and treaties. With this research that he, uh, he's been working on for over 50 years to halt testing of nuclear bombs, what a noble cause. His work with, his, uh, with others can now detect and measure using seismic waves. And this development, the development of this technology led up to the 1996 Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. And so since then, nuclear testing has nearly stopped and when it occurs, the entire world knows about it. And so, so Lynn, he received his bachelor's degree and his master's degree in geology and geophysics at MIT. Um, he then went on to Columbia University, earning his PhD in geology in 1965, where he stayed through his entire successful career. His accolades are long, and I'll just mention just a few so we can get into the talk. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, as well as the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a fellow of the American Geophysical Union, Geological Society of America, Geologic Society of London, and so on and so forth, and I can go on. But everyone, I think everyone gets the idea of how fortunate we are to have them this evening. So without further ado, Lynn, the mic is yours. Welcome. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you for the very kind introduction. Can everyone see me okay? I see I'd you. like to give you uh, just one minute of how did I get to do the things that have been described? Uh, one of the first things that happened was when I was seven years old, my father got a letter from a colleague in Trinidad. I was interested in the stamp and I went on to collect stamps. And through that, learning a lot about other countries, the peoples there, and eventually the geology. The next thing that happened uh, was that uh, my Aunt Ethel, when I was in about the fourth grade, sent me a chemistry set. My mother said, uh, uh, oh, you're going to blow up the house or poison yourself. And fortunately, both survived. And then I went on to MIT and Columbia. So let's have the first slide, please. Okay, so the second slide. Okay, so this is a map of earthquakes of the world. There are lots of them on here. Uh, what you can see is the particularly in the oceans, like in the middle of the Atlantic, on the left-hand side, there's a narrow band of earthquakes that follows along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge from the Arctic all the way down to South of South America, and then into the Indian Ocean and around into the Pacific Ocean. Uh, those can be seen easily on this slide, but there are other places in the continents where the earthquakes are a bit more spread out. But I use the slide to illustrate, for example, uh, here to the right of center is a very large region with very few earthquakes, except those near Hawaii. And this is called the Pacific Plate. So uh, before we get to that, let me mention here that uh, there are places where one plate, like the Pacific Plate in the West and down in the Southwest is going under uh, what is called an island arc. And now as we call it a subduction zone. And these are the places where earthquakes go down to as deep as 700 kilometers, 400 miles. So those are very special places and they have some of the world's largest earthquakes. So I'll be uh, turning to those uh, shortly. Okay, the next slide. These are the plates of the world. So you can see this large Pacific plate in light brown uh, that has very, very few earthquakes within it. It's the largest plate. Many people ask me, how many countries have you been to? But I then ask them, well, how many plates have you been to? So, uh, once you take a look at this, think back as to how many plates you have been to. I've been to nine. See if you can top me. The next slide. Okay, this is a model that we put together of the outer 10% of the earth uh, at the surface. Uh, and this extends from the right-hand side to where one plate is going down beneath the west coast of South America. Over on the left-hand side, one is going down beneath the Tongan and Fiji Islands of the South uh, West Pacific. In the center, we have a ridge where new material is being added as volcanic material along the East Pacific rise one of the fastest spreading and opening uh, parts of the mid-ocean bridge system. And then there are other features. Right in the center, you see two opposite arrows uh, that separate 
two ridge segments. Uh, that is called a transform fault. And in just a minute, I'll tell you how I got to there. Uh, the next slide. I might mention that when I was a young earth scientist, I was told uh, that I should not work on vague and false concepts like continental drift, that continents cannot plow through strong oceanic crust. Well, in fact, they don't, but continental drift does exist. But as a result, I didn't take drift seriously until the spring of 1966. Uh, there's a similar thing with predicting earthquakes, that many people, in fact, think that uh, earthquake prediction is not possible, giving various reasons. And Charles Richter said prediction is for fools and charlatans. So I'm going to make a stab at this, but for time scales of a few decades, not tomorrow and not for next week. The next slide. Okay, here's how I got into this subject. Uh, when I came to Columbia in 1960, I started working on certain types of earthquake waves uh, that crossed only oceanic areas. Uh, and as a consequence, I needed to study earthquakes that were uh, in the oceans, like these just to the left of center uh, in the South Pacific Ocean. Uh, and I needed them in order to examine some of these surface waves at stations on the borders of continents. I started working on earthquakes in this area uh, if someone can point to that, to the uh, uh, left of center, where you can see the earthquakes follow along the East Pacific rise to the south of there. They suddenly take a jog to the east for uh, 1,000 kilometers or 600 miles before they resume their trend to the north. Uh, I only found this out because I needed to have better locations of earthquakes for this other study. When I saw this, I wrote a paper about it in 1963, noticing that the earthquakes did not extend onto one of these features extending nearly east-west beyond the two ridges. But the main thing that caught my eye and I worked on for the next two years was that here was a major feature that I thought had horizontal motion on it like the San Andreas Fault of California. And if there were features like this in the ocean that hadn't been dis discovered, that that was very important. I did not concentrate at that time on the aspects of continental drift or plate tectonics, but I went on to look at several other places that had some big offsets uh, where the earthquakes suddenly changed direction. The next slide. When I was in the Fiji Islands in 1965, I heard about a paper by the Toronto geophysicist Tuzo Wilson, who used some of my data from that place uh, and proposed a new class of faults called transform faults. And these faults were one, like looking at this uh, figure uh, where it's labeled uh, just below center, uh, you can see that the precise locations of earthquakes, which I relocated, uh, fall right along an east-westerly trend, uh, and they do not extend off of these two ridge crests that are the diagonal uh, hatched lines. Before that time, most 
people working on these features believe that they had once been together, like these two features, and then offset the one to the north, offset to the left. But I then decided when I saw this magic magnetic profile by Pittman and Hertzler that they had obtained close to that area in the Pacific where I had studied. Uh, and when I saw their beautiful magnetic profiles that indicated seafloor spreading or continental drift was going on, I decided to work the next morning to see if Tuzo Wilson was right. In about two months, I had my first two earthquakes that I was able to examine the seismograms from about a uh, hundred stations around the world. And I found that lo and behold, for these two earthquakes, they agreed with the motion proposed by Tuzo Wilson. So if we look down there, even uh, at uh, below center uh, and uh, the place where there are a bunch of earthquakes with some arrows that the arrows determined by that I obtained from these seismograms were exactly opposite that for simple offset. So when I looked at these, I was just amazed that, hey, I said to myself, Tuso Wilson was right. And I went on to uh, get about 15 other earthquakes for which I published this in 1967. Okay, so these are called transform faults. This next one is one of those places where a plate, and these plates as illustrated previously are about uh, 60, miles thick, 100 kilometers. They're reasonably low temperature and they're strong. And they're underlain by material closer to the melting point that's been called the asthenosphere. So it's the gliding layer of plate tectonics. Here I'm going to look at earthquakes that are within one of these downgoing plates. Okay, if we look off to the uh, upper left hand side, we can see there that one line is where the plate boundary comes out into the ocean. For example, this might be the Pacific Ocean going under Japan, the volcanic arc of Japan and the overriding plate there. What I'm working on right now is really big earthquakes, giant earthquakes uh, of the last 25 years that break these large red circles. These have been called asperities uh, by the earthquake community and also people working on the physics of earthquakes and rock mechanics. So what I have found is that in many places uh, these are quiet for decades before the big earthquake breaks one of these giant asperities. But beforehand, there are other features like the smaller red dots that become active before as well as after the big earthquake. So if we didn't have these smaller features, smaller asperities, that get loaded up and break ahead of time, we would not have an indication of what is the size of a coming earthquake, uh, or hopefully to try to use that data to see if we can learn more about the earth, the coming earthquake before it actually happens. One other phenomena here, the SSEs are slow slip earthquakes. This is a fairly new phenomena of the last 20 years. Uh, they account for quite a bit of plate motion uh, as shown here at a deeper depth than the region that breaks in the large red 
uh, ovals. Uh, these are not felt, but they're very important, perhaps to understanding if they occur selectively before giant earthquakes. Okay, the next slide. So this is from the Japanese work on the great earthquake of 2011 off the east coast of the main Japanese island of Honshu. We can see contoured here going from the east coast of Japan out to the deepest part of the Japan Trench shown in solid blue, uh, the regions that slipped a lot in this earthquake, okay? And what is shown here with the big solid triangle are a feature that my colleagues have worked on called the centroid of that earthquake where most of the slip uh, is centered around that feature. So it defines the center of maximum slip as determined from seismic waves. The next slide, work done by uh, the group at Stanford was able to say that one decade before 2011, that the region indicated here in orange started to slip at depth not going all the way out to the trench, but fortunately in a place where there were instruments. Whereas the region to the north, the dark blue continued to compress uh, and eventually to have another earthquake, but not in uh, 2011. So this is a very exciting development that there are features like this that can be picked up by geodetic techniques like GPS. Uh, so the Japanese have been forerunners of installing instruments on the ocean floor and monitoring them from a ship at the surface to be able to determine the slip that happens ahead of time and that that happens during a really big earthquake. So this is an important development that we can use data from the seafloor uh, in addition to that that we've long had uh, from uh, the continents. Okay, the next slide. This is a, an earthquake that occurred in 2014, not quite as big as the previous earthquake that was magnitude nine, but this was magnitude 8.1. So uh, earthquakes of this size typically do a lot of damage. And if they rupture all the way out to the trench, they can produce a large seismic sea wave or tsunami. This one didn't make a very large sea wave. Uh, what is shown here, you can see the coastline of uh, Northern Chile and southern Peru uh, at the right-hand side and the deep sea trench over to uh, the left-hand side. So ahead of time, I looked at moderate size earthquakes, uh, ones that if they happened on, had happened on land, they could still cause a lot of damage. And you can see here, the ones in red are the ones that happened ahead of time. The green were aftershocks. What I've also shown here are other people's uh, compilations of how much sliding or displacement occurred in that earthquake and another one two days later called the Tokopia earthquake that was a little bit smaller and just to the south uh, centered the slip in the green circle. The blue represents uh, the estimate of slip made by my colleagues. And you can see its center uh, or the square is very close to the area that broke the most in the earthquake. 
the earthquakes ahead of time were not there. They were uh, uh, outside of that region of maximum slip, but inside of that that broke a little bit, the uh, uh, dotted lines. Uh, so one of the things that this tells me is that we need to concentrate if we want to do prediction on various time scales with some of these events that are not in the place where we expect maximum slip to occur. And we found this was true in California, that there was slip on the San Andreas fault or earthquakes, I'm sorry, not slip. The slip occurred in the great earthquake of 1906. But there were a lot of earthquakes in the 25 years before 1906 that occurred nearby but off the San Andreas Fault. So this is an indication of where we have a lot of work to do of trying to refine our estimates of uh, earthquake prediction going from decadal time scales, perhaps down to one to 10 years and hopefully uh, less than that. The next slide. This Iquique earthquake in Northern Chile uh, is uh, perhaps uh, the poster child for earthquake prediction. People found many different things about that earthquake, including in this case, I've summed up the amount of slip that happened called on the vertical axis, the cumulative seismic moment. And we can see here that it accelerated with time. If, if it had just, the cumulative moment had just uh, happened uniformly with time, this would have been a uh, line uh, increasing, but uh, with a constant slope. In this case, we had an increase in the seismic moment uh, going back about five years ahead of time. There were many other things that were observed uh, before this earthquake ahead of time by other investigators, which is why I call it a poster child. Let's go back one slide. Uh, other workers have looked at data from a local uh, network of seismic instruments on the coast of Northern Chile and south Southeastern Peru. And they have found that this region to the east of the major slip zone, uh, which is quiet here for magnitude five and larger earthquakes, then when they looked at smaller earthquakes, uh, but still ones that could be felt, it was active on that Eastern side, as well as on the Western side where there were more larger earthquakes. And the other thing you can see is that the earthquakes ahead of time uh, did not extend much north of the rupture zone, north of uh, say 19.5 degrees south, or south of uh, uh, 21 degrees. So they were an indication that this was about the size of the coming earthquake. And it wasn't going to be as large as a much larger giant earthquake that previously broke this and adjacent regions in 1877. So let's go two slides ahead. Okay. This is another region that I've looked at uh, in Indonesia off the coast of Sumatra, of which you can see the land there in green and the mountains of Sumatra. Here is a really big earthquake, a magnitude eight and a half, followed very quickly the same day by a magnitude 7.9 earthquake. Uh, this 8.5 uh, was bordering on being a giant earthquake by my reckoning of sizes. 
So we can see that the large blue circle is right in the middle of the region that was computed uh, by others to have the largest slip in 2007. Again, we can see that the red symbols, which are the moderate and large earthquakes beforehand, uh, did not occur within that region, uh, that they were largely outside of it to the southeast and to the northwest. So the next slide. Okay, so this will just tell you that I have a book, Plate Tectonics and Great Earthquakes, uh, that's available through Columbia University Press. And the next is a book that I published about three years ago of my work on detecting and identifying underground atomic tests called Silencing the Bomb. So with that, I will stop and take some questions. Well, thank you. That was amazing um, to actually see your research in action. Is, uh, so so um, I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of questions, but I actually have some questions of my own I would love to ask you about. Um, well, first of all, uh, Ann Passos, she's got a question because uh, her son went down to the Caribbean island called Aguela and it had a big earthquake recently. And, um, and so her question was something along the lines of like, so should her son be worried that uh, after this earthquake, you know, could there be a tsunami or anything like that? <laughs> what do you think? Well, that region, Anguilla, is part of what are called the Lesser Antilles mm -hmm. that extends from the south near Trinidad up to uh, St. Kitts in the north, uh, including Martinique and Guadeloupe. So that is an active subduction zone where the Atlantic seafloor and uh, the North American plate is plunging beneath the Caribbean plate in that region. So you can expect to have big earthquakes, but they don't happen as often as they do in Southern Alaska or Japan. But still, it's something that you need to be aware of uh, and if you start feeling one, probably duck and cover. Yes. So uh, I can't give her a, a clean bill of health, but I don't expect to see one in the next week. But I never can tell uh, when the next big one will happen. That area off Anguilla had a really big earthquake that caused a tsunami. Uh, in the 1860s. Okay. Wow. So, um, so, so it sounds like be careful, but and, uh, and if you feel something, duck and cover. And so, so for me, um, you know, I actually, you know, I teach about plate tectonics. You know, at a low, you know, simple level to to a first year geologist. And so, and so I've you know read to some of the background of what you and Walter Pittman and others have done. Um, and so, uh, is there like maybe, uh, can, can you share with us maybe a story about a eureka moment or a aha moment uh, by, by you, maybe one of your colleagues, when it became clear that the plate tectonics was about to change, you know, like this idea of plate tectonics was going to change on how we think about geologic processes forever? Well, this happened with me in the spring of 1966 when I came back from the Fiji Islands working there on deep earthquakes. And I had read Tuzo Wilson's paper and thought, is there something I could do to try and prove his theory? Uh, and I was thinking about it uh, actively. And then I was invited up to Pittman's office to see his magic profile. And that was an aha moment for me, the first one. The next morning, I decided to work on these mechanisms of examining the 100 earthquake, 100 seismograms or records of a given earthquake. 
And when I got the first two of them about two months later, I had another aha moment that, oh, this agrees with what Tuzo Wilson said. And I was a convert to continental drift, a skeptic before that. Sure, because uh, the idea of continental drift, the mechanism was rough, was incorrect, you know, from Wagoner. And so, um, but you figured out, you and your colleagues were able to figure out what the mechanism for continental, for the movement of the continents. It's amazing. Well, it turned out that Wagner was right about the geology of South America, the West Coast, fitting that of uh, South America but he had the wrong speed with which the North Atlantic was opening. So he was criticized strongly about that. And many sure. geologists thought that uh, this was just uh, crazy geology. So it really took the advent of data from the oceans in late 1950s, early 60s, to furnish data like that that Pittman collected. Yeah, and, and for the audience, you know, who doesn't hasn't read about plate tectonics in depth, you know, we didn't understand what the bottom of the oceans were. We thought that they were maybe the oldest crust in, in the world. And as and as you showed, that they're among the youngest crust. And it was just completely turning everything upside down. So, you know, when, when it comes to plate tectonics, are there still any debates or mysteries about plate tectonics, or have we kind of figured most of the things out? Well, we figured out those large plates. Mm -hmm. uh, it took a while to figure out that there's some quite small plates that are 100 miles across. Yeah. For example, there's one near Easter Island in the South Pacific that's called the Easter Plate. But still, it follows along with plate tectonics. Mm -hmm. The regions that give us the most trouble are some of the continents like Europe and Asia, in which the earthquake zones are uh, wider than they are in the oceans. Uh, so people will define some small plates, uh, or recently I, in fact today, I've been working on an earthquake in Shitsuan province, China, uh, along what is a very active fault but people have debated whether that is a plate boundary. It's on the eastern side of Tibet. Okay. Wow. So, so, then, so it isn't like um, everything's been figured out yet, which is great because uh, whether uh, the audience, whether uh, you're a student or you're, you're not sure what you want to do, you know, geology, there's so many mysteries out there still. I know, you know, well, you, Lynn, saw some of the big, fundamental aspects, but there's so many other aspects that are still, for every question you answered, there's probably new questions out there being asked. And so, so, um, so you know, you brought up uh, near the end uh, about um, trying to, um, you know, being able to detect nuclear uh, uh, underground explosions. And, um, and so, um, so, so one of the things that, you know, we've been trying to have a test ban treaty for decades and decades, and we still don't really have a full commitment from everyone. You know, what's holding back that aspect of full enforcement, or is there a couple of countries that are trying to drag their feet? Well, we have the full test ban that mm -hmm. happened in 1996. Uh, it was signed by then all of the countries that had nuclear weapons. Uh, India and Pakistan tested two years later. They didn't sign the treaty, but they stopped testing after 1998. North Korea is the only country that has tested underground or anywhere uh, since the treaty went into effect in 1996. Uh, the treaty was signed by Clinton uh, and uh, the U.S. has followed it. Uh, all of the countries of the world, except for North Korea, have followed it. And we know that from the data. Exactly. We're not just guessing. <laughs> uh, but in order for the treaty 
to finally be approved uh, and enter into complete force, it must be signed by all of the countries that have nuclear weapons uh, and those that have reactors that could make bomb fuel. So the United States and China are two holdouts from this. In order to get this treaty passed by the United States, the United States to ratify, we have to have two thirds vote of the Senate. So I do not see that in the cards for right now, but I think it's important that we do not resume nuclear testing underground because China and Russia and Pakistan and India, et cetera, will catch up relative to us. We have the most experience of any country of testing. Okay, wow. So, um, so I'm looking, I, 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 when I started asking my questions, I started realizing that there's a lot of quest great questions from the audience here. So let's move into this, okay? Um, so, okay, the first one um, is from Tom from you on YouTube. How do you measure the actual forces at plate interfaces? That's more difficult to measure what are called those stresses. They've been estimated, but you can't measure them really precisely with some instrument. You mm -hmm. can determine them either from the seismic waves or for some other measurements or modeling. But uh, that's not as accurately known as the amount of displacement that takes place over a fault zone in a really big earthquake. So um, have you ever heard of the earthquake scientist or predictor that goes by the pseudonym Duchess Innes? Most of the predictions seem to be on YouTube and appears to be on Cannery, uh, uh, very accurate. Wonder if he's known as credible to others or more of as a hype social media sensation. No, I don't know of his work. Okay, sounds good. So um, let's see, another question. Lynn, um, do you think that seven plus magnitude earthquakes a couple of days ago on the plate between Antarctica and South America is a predictor for more unrest to come in the near future, especially along the west coast of South America and Chile? Well, that earthquake of a few days ago was uh, south of South America, the right. southern tip of South America. Mm -hmm. It was like a bunch of earthquakes that are, for example, like the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, mm -hmm. uh, that it's along a transform fault. Okay. So it's not one that uh, uh, when it occurred was a danger to very many people, maybe to none. Uh, but nevertheless, it's one that we could study. I haven't studied it yet to try and learn more about long-term prediction, decadal and year prediction. Right. So, so this, I haven't read about this earthquake. This was in the, this was in the Scotia Sea, I guess? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, currently, uh, here's another question. Have you ever studied the earthquakes that struck uh, uh, Hilo in 1946 and 1960 in Hawaii? I think you're talking about the 1946 earthquake that mm -hmm. was uh, in the eastern Aleutian Islands. Maybe it's okay. Uh, it was one that produced a lot of very long waves mm -hmm. uh, and it generated a really big tsunami that did damage in Hilo, uh, oh. Hawaii. Uh, and it was in fact the tsunami was felt all over the Pacific. Mm. So it was an earthquake that was a surprise, but the data are not nearly as good as that that we've had for the last few decades. So here's a question that I would have asked. What are some of the research needs to improve understanding of earthquake predictions? Well, right now in the United States, 
uh, there is not much work on earthquake prediction. Mm. I think this may be changing. Uh, that Iquique earthquake in northern Chile, I think, convinced a number of uh, people in the age group 25 to 50 that this was worth working on. Uh, but after the failure of a prediction at a place in central California called Parkfield in 2004, the US Geological Survey got antsy about prediction and they stopped funding for prediction. Uh, and also there were a number of people that exclaimed earthquakes are not predictable and saying it many times. Uh, and so this has led to a, uh, a lack of funding in the United States and more people working on, if you have an earthquake, how can you predict better the amount of shaking that happens at a given place? So I think we need to have work on both of those topics. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. So well, here's another question, whether you're just coming in uh, fast and furious. And so, so, okay, so where does the source of energy that forces the earth to rearrange its huge mass come from to generate an earthquake? How do you know about studying that source of energy what instruments and can you use? And how unstable is the Earth's crust before a complete meltdown? I'm not sure what that last part means. But um, so, so what's the energy to, to, that um, produces plate tectonics and earthquakes? Well, the thing that causes the plates to move are convection of material, movement of material uh, beneath the plates. Uh, particularly in the asthenosphere and perhaps going down uh, beneath the deepest earthquakes. Uh, and one other thing that causes the plates to move is that uh, the material that's going down in those island arcs or subduction zones is cold. So it's cold compared to the surrounding material and it's more dense. So it's something that pulls on the rest of the plates. Uh, but we still have a lot to understand about convective motion and the driving forces of plates. So, so here's a great follow-up question. It's, it's perfect for this. And I actually have, I'm not, a, I'm just a novice when it comes to seismology and earthquakes and plate tectonics, but the idea, um, so are the plates uh, being pulled down, or are they uh, being pushed, or are they being pulled down? Probably the pull down is the greater force. Exactly. The mid ocean ridges are of higher elevation mm -hmm. than, say, the older material between the mid Atlantic Ridge and the United States. Mm -hmm. So there is one force there of spreading of that material that's up at a higher elevation, tending to move the plates there. Mm -hmm. But it's probably the convection beneath uh, and the pulling at the trenches that is more important. Okay, because um, I remember a class decades ago um, where the, uh, at least the professor at that point we're saying that the gravitational potential of the um, mid-ocean ridges was about equal to pulling down at, um, um, at, at the trenches. And now, you know, you're saying, and I've been reading the literature that supports that most of the pull, the pull is much stronger than the gravitational potential of, of the mid-ocean ridges. So, yeah, so, so uh, that's always an important point. So if you're, anyone who's taken Geology 101 and they call, is it push or pull? It's the pull going down, exactly. So, okay, so we have a couple more questions. Can you hang on for this for a couple sure. more? Absolutely, great. Um, what are the most dangerous places versus the safest places were in terms of uh, seismic activity? And actually they put it up, for example, fracking in Oklahoma, you know, so. Well, before the fracking was done in Oklahoma, Oklahoma was in, as it still is, in the middle of the North American plate and had very few earthquakes. So 
in those regions where uh, fluid is pumped back into the earth, that's a result of the fracking process that has produced earthquakes. Some of them have been up in the damaging range, magnitude five and a half to almost six, uh, but they're still not magnitude eight earthquakes like 1906 San Francisco. Yeah, but uh, a magnitude five or six in Oklahoma, the buildings aren't made to withstand earthquakes. That's right. Yeah. So there's quite a bit of damage in mm -hmm. some of those larger earthquakes. And that finally led uh, people in the state government of Oklahoma to stop saying the earthquakes have nothing to do with fracking and to take that idea seriously. Excellent. Uh, it's about time. You know, people have to accept science. They can believe in Santa Claus, but they got to accept science. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, here, one of the problems was of uh, Oklahoma, of course, produces a lot of oil mm -hmm. and gets a lot of income from the extraction of oil and gas. So they were not anxious to hear that earthquakes may be messing up that process. And so, okay, so here's a question. Um, I'll just throw it at you here. Many people believe that the Three Gorges Dam had something to do with the 2008 Sichuan earthquake. Um, any thoughts about that? I think that that's still questionable. Okay. So, 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 so there is possibly some link to it between the, the dam and the earthquake. Some people have claimed that, okay. but I'm not sure that it's any more than a hypothesis. Okay certainly has not been proven to be so. Okay, so, so the data is thin. Okay, so, <laughs> okay, so we have um, two more questions, okay? So we live in the Pacific Northwest near Main, Mount St. Helens and Krakatoa near Sumatra is near where you describe earthquakes. Can you describe the relationship between volcanic eruptions and earthquake activity? Well, these subduction zones with the trenches and big earthquakes like Southern Alaska and Japan, uh, that they are places that often have volcanic activity and ones in which the chemistry of the volcanic rocks is rather unique. So they occur in the same places, uh, but whether the two are very intimately related in terms of cause and effect of a big earthquake being caused by uh, a volcanic eruption is more questionable. It may be happening on, on a small scale. Okay, fair enough. And so uh, we have one more question, okay? Um, so um, is deep underwater volcanic activity such as in the Mid-Pacific been studied as, as it relates to earthquakes? Well, Hawaii is at the end, the southeastern end of what's called a plume. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's volcanic activity in which the Pacific plate has moved over this hot spot of volcanic material. So if you trace it back in time, uh, you find that there was uh, volcanic activity three million years ago in the Western Hawaiian Islands and earlier in Midway. Uh -huh. And then the, the track of that previous uh, line of uh, volcanic activity extends up to Kamchatka, excuse me, and the Western Aleutians to, to about 53 million years ago. Wow. So that's some hot, that's a long lived hotspot. It uh, is. Yeah. And, and so we have, we have one more question that came in. Okay. And I have a follow, one last question myself I would like to uh, ask. So will the principles from plate tectonics be similar on other planets or is the planet composition or different in terms of whatever gravitation, magnet, magnetic forces, you know, so uh, so what's about plate tectonics on other planets in our solar system? Well, right now it's not going on today. Yeah. 
-hmm. but there's speculation about in the early history of Mercury, uh, Venus, and Mars as to whether there might have been some plate tectonic activity, but it then died out. So if we're going to find uh, plate motion on other planets, we have to look outside of our own solar system to some of the many planets that have been found around other stars. Wow. Okay, so, so basically platonics, uh, plate tectonics is a unique Earth mechanism, uh, at least in this solar system. There are questions about when did plate tectonics start on the yeah. Earth. Uh, I that. <laughs> about uh, that. It's pretty clear that it started as early as half the age of the Earth, okay. 2.5 million years ago. Million years and ago. there's speculations on whether it happened earlier than that. Okay. Yeah, and in fact, at, at, uh, at Le Mans, about, I don't know, three, four years ago, they had a seminar every Friday where they talked about the early plate tectonics of Earth. And, um, and I brought my, actually brought my geology class up there. And we were blown away by the new science and understanding of um, early plate tectonics. And so I just want uh, one more question I just would love to ask you is, um, what are you working on now? You have two books out and anything well, else? Well, I've been working on these great earthquakes, okay. both at the trenches, the subduction zones, and more recently at some of the strike slip earthquakes of the world. So I mentioned I'm working right now on the Shitsuan earthquake. 2008 in uh, China, right on the border between Eastern Tibet uh, and the main plate of uh, China. Okay, so that's what I'm doing right now. And, and it, that must be part. That must be part of uh, the big collision with India and uh, Eurasia, I guess. Yes. So that that collision has pushed Tibet uh, out, and particularly out to the east. Uh, mm -hmm. So I was fortunate in 1974 to be part of the U.S. Earthquake Studies delegation in China. Mm -hmm. So one of the places that we visited was uh, Kunming, China, to the south of this region. But in fact, we landed for lunch uh, in Shetswan province. Oh. And I had a marvelous view out the window of the east side of these mountains that form the, the, the eastern side of them forms this large fault that broke in 2008. So it was a spectacular mountain range there. Yeah, and that's in the Sichuan, okay. I was there many years ago and I, I was, uh, and I remember seeing the beautiful mountains uh, rising up. And so, um, so with that, it's eight o'clock. Uh, thank you so much, Lynn. Um, I appreciate, and the club and everyone who's been watching really appreciates, um, you know, I'll have to get, I'll be the only one who can clap. Uh, everyone else is clapping virtually. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> um, I, I'm glad how many people, uh, were listening. Do you have any idea how many? Uh, to, to someone, uh, Kevin would find out, and, uh, the, but, um, I'm sure there's a lot. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so it's actually more than typically that we could fit in the room because it's coming from around the world. We're getting uh, from Australia, from New Zealand, Europe, Asia, all the club members, as well as people who are not even club members, but since you can watch it on Facebook for free and free is better than cheap, we always, we're always we getting bigger audiences than we've ever gotten before. So thank you so much. You're quite welcome. Okay. And so everyone, so, uh, so tomorrow we're going to follow up with, um, after Lynn's talk with now, we're going to talk about earthquake readiness. So same channel, same time tomorrow night. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.